Hi there, welcome once again to the Dukascopy TV studio. I'm Ben Jones. Alongside me for an update on Islamic finance is John Sandwick. John, thank you very much for joining us again. It's my pleasure. So, to begin with, we've had quite a few developments uh, with Islamic finance capital markets. Can you give us your reaction to some of this news? Well, there's, you know, there's the hard news and then there's some soft news. Uh, let me just mention the soft news first. I went to a conference at, uh, in Luxembourg at the end of June, uh, Islamic Finance in Europe, and I have never before at any conference uh, on Islamic finance in, in any part of Europe seen more participation, more f uh, corporate and government presence than the one I saw in Luxembourg. It was truly amazing. And what I think that reflects is a, a much greater interest across a very broad spectrum of uh, corporate finance throughout Europe, whether it's corporate finance for municipal or sovereign or, co or, or, or private sector corporate users of uh, public capital. So on the soft news, I sense a much greater uh, interest and in understand or desire for understanding in Islamic finance across the board in Europe. Um, on hard news, at the end of June, we had Europe's first uh, sovereign sukuk issuer. And if you will, this is the first time in history that a, uh, a non-Muslim sovereign government issued Islamic bonds. And the government of U United Kingdom issued 200 million pounds of sukuk. They're five-year pounds. They were priced precisely uh, as if they were uh, gilt uh, bonds. There was no premium because they were Islamic. And the most important thing for me was that the, this 200 million uh, pounds issuance was 12 times oversubscribed. I mean, this is just phenomenal. I mean, in the bond market, you hear of a, a bond issuance might be one and a half or two times oversubscribed, but 12 times oversubscribed. I even read once uh, in one place that it was 13 times oversubscribed. In other words, there was huge demand for this British government five-year Islamic bond. The other interesting thing is that over 50% of the, of, the, of, the, of the government of Britain's sukuk was purchased by institutional investors in the United Kingdom. In other words, they treated the sukuk as if it were a bond of the UK government. And I thought that was indicative of the, what the general public should know about Islamic finance, is, is it works in, the, in much the same way as any finance, but of course it has the ethical and socially responsible component to it. The other good news is the government of Luxembourg is going to be the second sovereign non-Muslim country issuer in the world. It's doing roadshow right now. It's named uh, the lead arrangers and lead managers of its own sukuk, and it will issue sometime at the end of September or the beginning of October. So this year we will have seen the two first ever European government sukuk issuances. Now I was recently in Milano, also toward the end of June, and I sat in a conference and I was speaking uh, at an event in Milano sponsored by a large corporate uh, law firm in Italy. And of the audience, it was an amazing cross-section of Italian uh, corporate uh, municipal and government borrowers. Many of the major uh, corporations were represented. Uh, large, very, very large real estate investment trusts were there. I'm talking about real estate in investment trusts with five to 10 billion euros of assets. Uh, we had members of the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance. Everybody was there in that Milano event to talk about Sukuk and the, the first Italian Sukuk. Now, you know, all new innovations start first with a concept and then talk. Like the UK Sukuk, there was four or five years of talk and now it's reality. The fact that the Italians are now talking about this and that corporations and municipalities uh, are thinking about converting a portion of their borrowings to Islamic finance uh, means that in a few years, maybe next year, maybe the year after, we're going to see Italy's first sukuk. You know, the government of Sardinia, I'm sorry, the government of Sicily has something like uh, 30 billion or 40 billion dollars of outstanding international bonds, not euro bonds, we're talking dollar bonds in the euro bond market. If they're borrowing in dollars in five, ten year uh, maturities, the government of Sicily should be also borrowing in the Islamic capital markets. It'd be just one more diversified source of funding for them. So it was a, great, it was a very important year for a breakout in the Islamic finance community in Europe. Okay, and what's happening with European Islamic banking? 
We saw over the evolution of Islamic finance since, if you will, the, the mid-1990s or really the early 2000s, the, the, the beginning of the Islamic banking community in London. There was a Gatehouse Bank, there was um, Bank of London in the Middle East, a few other prominent Islamic banks were launched and placed in London. And for the most part, they're doing well. I was visiting uh, Bank of London in the Middle East last week and I talked to their CEO. Uh, they've just launched a new small and medium-sized enterprise uh, liquidity uh, facility for UK corporates. And so they're gonna go out and lend money to small and medium-sized businesses throughout the UK. And they've dedicated something like 35 or 50 million pounds for this uh, activity. So the, the Islamic banking community in Europe is alive and well in London. However, Europe's a large community with over 500 million people in the Union, and uh, there is no other Islamic banking in all of Europe. Not here in Switzerland, not in Spain, not in uh, France. However, also at the end of June, also at this uh, very important conference I went to in Luxembourg, the Minister of Finance of the government of Luxembourg announced that they were just awarding the first banking license to the first uh, Islamic Bank in Continental Europe. It's called Europe, European Islamic Bank or Eurus Bank. And Eurus Bank is, is going to start business sometime in October or November, we don't know, but it's this autumn. It's uh, starting business with about 60 million euros paid in capital. I happen to know personally one of the shareholders who's putting in half of that capitalization, 30 million euros. And Eurus Bank uh, intends to be a, a power center, if you will, for Islamic f asset management for European Muslims. Fantastic. And then finally, what's the situation at the moment for Islamic asset management? Well, you know, we started uh, two years ago, our Safa Investment Services. A lot of people couldn't believe that Islamic asset management could compete with conventional asset management. Uh, as we have shown again and again, our data, uh, run through software, which is the same software they use at JP Morgan. It's the same software they use at Credit Suisse. The data comes from Bloomberg's. We, compi we compile portfolios in uh, you know, the various common strategies, low, medium, and high risk. And so in replicating global asset management with Sharia, but using the fundamental principles of asset management that are common everywhere, and using the same data sources and using the same software to do asset allocation, we construct portfolios. And uh, I can tell you right now, our portfolios through every part of the economic cycle since 2008 are strongly outperforming conventional. This year, we're anywhere from 6 to 12%, depending on the strategy, uh, net return to the clients. And importantly, in, in, in every strategy, we are outperforming conventional. Uh, so Islamic asset management is proving to be very resilient, very real, and very uh, credible. Uh, I want to add one more thing. You know, our primary market is Saudi Arabia. We run around Riyadh and Jeddah and ask rich people to give us money. Plus, of course, the institutional investors there. The local market in Saudi Arabia is up 26% year to date. And so, you know, everywhere you go in the world, people have a tendency to invest locally before they invest internationally. So the local markets in some of these places we visit are so strong, it's, it's hard to tempt someone to go to global because the local market's performing so well. Uh, so in, the, in terms of the balance of uh, risk and reward that our clients want, we see them tempted by the rewards of high risk investing and the rewards are, this year at least are there in spades. Fantastic. John, once again, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for watching. Do make sure you keep clicking back to Dukoscopic TV as we'll be bringing you plenty more updates and exclusive interviews. Bye for now.